Okay, so my slot begins. Um, those of you who have been before, which I, I know is a few of you, will be familiar with the format. We never change it because we think it works okay and the feedback's always all right. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at the, the judiciary um, of the patents uh, judges, the patents courts in 2022. It, nothing changed, uh, so easy, easy slide to begin with. But two points to make on retirements. Um, if you look at the Court of Appeal, you'll see Sir Christopher Floyd there, who did sit and hear cases. He heard two cases, I think, in 2022, notwithstanding that he retired the year earlier, as he had to, age 70, in 2021. Um, now, the retirement age has since changed. In March 2022, the government thought it would be okay for judges to sit till they're 75. Uh, Sir Christopher had already gone by then, but he came back, not as a Lord Justice of Appeal, but just as Sir Christopher Floyd to hear a couple of cases. Lord Kitchen will go this year in September. So he, and he'll actually go age 68. So he's going seven years before he needs to. So what about uh, numbers? How many patent cases there were? Well, happy to say the output of the courts is back to full strength. 81 decisions in total. Uh, that's everything, uh, uh, first instance and um, uh, interim decisions, costs, the, the full works. Um, that's the highest number we've had since 2019. Um, and looking more specifically at the types of decisions, the first instance cases, eight, uh, 20 first instance judgments has been the highest for, for, for five years. So um, quite, quite nice to see um, uh, that. And similarly with appeals, 12 is the highest number we've had for, for five years. Um, no Supreme Court decisions, which is unusual because every year for the past five we have had a Supreme Court uh, decision, at least one, but not last year. although. I'm sure you know that the Dabas case has already been heard this year, and we've got a Kibia and Fibrogen in the pipe for, I think it's this, uh, for 24 next year. So the Supreme Court still being active there, and, and those decisions will come. I always say life sciences and telecoms dominate. Uh, that is very much still true, particularly on the friend side. And as we'll see for, for the slides tonight, uh, there's a bit of a jurisdiction theme. So that's anybody with an interest in jurisdiction matters. Um, there's plenty for you tonight. Looking at that in terms of a bar chart, I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, you can just see that in terms of those decisions of substance, the, the, the bar for 2022 is the highest it's been since 2009. So that's what I mean about being back to full strength and output. In terms of the judges hearing cases, I always think this is an interesting uh, slide to look at. Mr. Justice Mead, by far and away the busiest judge, hearing twice as many cases as anybody else. Um, in gold medal position, if you like, uh, Meller in silver. It was the opposite last year, so the, I don't know whether they have some sort of arrangement where they say, well, I'll do this, I'll be busy this year and you do it next year. But um, that's exactly what's happened at least for the past couple of years. So they are the technical patents judges. They hear the most complex cases. And after that, it tails off rapidly. A mixture of deputies and commercial judges. Um, quite notable that um, some of those commercial judges, often competition law judges, hear patents cases, and that's starting to have a real influence on the way the courts are handling matters like interim injunctions and particular quantification of damages, um, which we can come on to talk more about that later on. Right, uh, I'm afraid a gloomy slide if you're a patentee. Um, the outcomes show a, a sort of increase in the number of patents being found invalid. Uh, so you can see there that we've dipped down to about 30% uh, of only of patents being held valid, um, which is a low number and the lowest it's been for some time. But the sample size is small, so it's probably not, um, not worth reading too much into this. For example, if you just take two cases, um, the Apixaban litigation was responsible for killing four of BMS's patents, so four patents went down in one uh, war, if you like. Um, and then the uh, JCB and Manitou litigation was responsible for killing off three uh, JCB patents. So already there, just with two cases, we've got seven patents being killed, um, which is to say that, you know, without that, the trend line would be a lot higher. Sound like a politician trying to um, try, trying to make good a bad situation, but honestly, I mean, I think I think it's not it's not hopeless. Often the patents that get revoked are weak patents. 
infringement very much on trend, so 75% so ish of, uh, of um, uh, cases finding infringement, um, which is about what we'd expect to see. So looking at the uh, more specific detail on that in terms of the um, outcomes where infringement and validity are in suit together or, or, or not, uh, you can see that the most common outcome is where there's a revocation only action and the patent is being held invalid as eight counts of that. Um, the top outcome for the patentee of, of having the patent valid and infringed is six out of 25, so about roughly 25% of cases, um, best result for the patentee. Best outcome for the defendant would be um, invalid and not infringed, that's the orange of three cases, 10, sort of 10%-ish. Um, but of course, anything where the patent's held invalid is good if you are the, um, the competitor or the defendant, and then you could say about 25, 75% rather, uh, of cases are a win um, in that sense of the patent being held invalid, which is consistent with what we saw on the earlier slide. So finally, um, the real depth of granularity on those, on those statistics comes with the types of challenge. And this is the first year I can remember where there's actually only been two successful pleas um, against patent validity being here, obviousness and insufficiency. They were the only grounds on which patents were revoked in 2022, according to our numbers. And you can see that obviousness successful about or just over 50% of the time. It's a, that's a little bit lower on the numbers of the past few years. Often obviousness has a kill rate of about 60, 65%, um, but obviously never much higher than that because it's a, it's a difficult ground on which to succeed. Insufficiency at about 35, 36%. Um, is probably about right. Previous couple of years, it was were no cases, I think, last year, and then about 50% of the cases before that had a successful plea. Um, it's speculation, because I don't know enough about the detail of those cases, but the thing that binds obviousness and insufficiency together, of course, in certain cases is plausibility. Um, and, uh, you know, on the obviousness side, if you've got a lack of technical contribution argument um, and insufficiency, often with claim scope, that's quite topical, and we might come on to say more about that later. So for now, I'll finish, and I'm going to hand over to Katie, who's going to take our first case. Uh, so introducing the top 10, and in at number 10 uh, this year is a case between Sandoz, uh, Teva, and Bristol-Myers Squibb. Um, this case related to um, one of the world's uh, top five selling medicines, Apixaban, um, with sales of over $16 billion uh, in 2021. Um, the patent, uh, Apixaban is an anticoagulant um, and it, it works by binding and inhibiting factor 10A, um, which is a key component of coagulation in the blood. Um, Sandoz and Teva sought to revoke BMS's compound patent and SPC um, and BMS counterclaim for infringement, although that really wasn't an issue because infringement was admitted if the patent was valid. The grounds um, on which the invalidity claim were brought were la mainly lack of sufficiency and, and a grievo obviousness, but the underlying attack was one of plausibility. There was no um, additional um, attack on the SPC, it stood or fell with the patent. Um, it was quite a complex case and it was heard over seven days uh, in February last year before Mr Justice Mead. So what happened? Um, the patent describes uh, a class of factor 10A inhibitors by reference to um, Marcouche formula, followed by about 140 examples, um, one of which is a Pixaban. The disclosures of the application as filed were similar, and it was agreed between the parties that the um, judgment on uh, assessment of plausibility should be made on the application as filed, or there could be possible added matter um, attacks. So when the court then looked at the application as filed, um, it, found, it noted that although there was reference to binding assays that had been undertaken, there were no, um, no information about which compounds those assays had been undertaken in relation to the results of them, or whether in fact any of the um, compounds which had had assays undertaken with the results were, to, were, any, were any of them a pixaban. Um, and so, as a result of that, the application didn't make it plausible that a pixaban could bind um, and to factor 10A, and given its 
um, ability to act as an anticoagulant was based upon that binding, um, the patent was held to be implausible. Um, interestingly, BMS had sought to rely upon the structure of a pixaban and what was known in the CGK about binding, um, therefore to predict some kind of binding affinity. Um, the court said you can't do that and in any event the actual binding affinity um, uh, of a pixaban couldn't have been predicted. Um, and also, as it suggests on the slide, if there was going to be a reliance upon lots of matters from the CGK, then um, uh, BMS were not bringing uh, anything to the party, so to speak, um, and they have, weren't making any technical contribution. Um, and as it says in the final sentence, CGK is not BMS's contribution. So why did we think this case was important? Um, it's an attack on a compound patent, which we don't often see. Um, it was a compound pattern that fell on an attack of plausibility, um, which shows the kind of standing that plausibility is now uh, having in our procedure and our law. It's kind of taking on um, a bit more of a life of its own. Um, the judgment itself is an excellent review of the EPO and UK case law on plausibility, um, and it confirms quite clearly that the UK position um, is that as set out in Warner Lambert. Um, by Lord Sumption, and it also confirms the UK kind of higher standard of ab initio plausibility. Um, this case is on appeal and due to be heard in mid-April, um, and while the Court of Appeal is obviously bound by Warner Lambert at the Supreme Court, um, we will be interested to see whether anything gets said um, following last week's decision in G221. Um, and as Dom briefly mentioned uh, as well, we do have the Fibrogen Appeal, which has plausibility um, questions going to the Supreme Court in March next year, which may give them a chance uh, to talk about uh, plausibility again um, and maybe relook at Warner Lambert if they think they need to in light of G221 and hopefully maybe some more application of that before the EPO um, as to how that's going to go forward. At number nine, uh we're cheating slightly on this one because uh, we're actually going to fit in two cases, but I promise that I'm going to do the second one very quickly. Um, so this first case is about jurisdiction in a global patent war not so very far away between um, Nokia and Oppo. Uh, which one of those is the dark side? I'll let you guys decide. Um, before we delve into the, the background of this one, um, for those of you that are less familiar with FRAND, uh, it's basically the idea is uh, that, that patentees are required to agree to license uh, standardized technology such as 4G and 5G on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, or FRAND for short. Um, and patents which, which cover standardized technology uh, are usually referred to as standard essential patents, or SEPs. So um, the, the, the background for this one is fairly typical for a, a UK FRAND action. Um, Nokia asserted infringement of a number of UK SCPs against Oppo in the UK uh, and sought a determination of the terms of a, of a global FRAN license. Um, Oppo challenged the jurisdiction of the court to hear the claim um, and also sought a, a, a stay of the proceedings on case management grounds in favour of parallel proceedings that were happening in China. Now, um, Oppo's point was really this, that this dispute was nothing to do with UK patents. It was all about the, the, global, the global FRAN license, the, the global FRAN dispute. Um, and since that most of their sales were in China, the more appropriate forum for that dispute was China. Now, the English, the English court's jurisdiction to settle the terms of a global FRAN license is well established in the um, Unwired Planet versus Huawei uh, Supreme Court case. But Oppo had a cunning plan. Um, they argued that two things had changed since that decision. Um, the first one is that the Chinese court now has jurisdiction to settle the terms uh, of a global, at least global FRAN rates, global FRAN license. Uh, and the second one is that now the UK has cut its ties to the, U to the EU, um, so it's, it's no longer part of the recast Brussels regulation. Uh, the rules of jurisdiction, uh, the, the, the rules of jurisdiction in the, U in the recast Brussels regulation no longer apply. Um, at first instance, His Honour Judge Hakon dismissed Oppo's uh, jurisdiction challenge on the grounds that these two factors didn't really affect the, the Supreme Court's reasoning at all. Um, it was still a dispute about uh, infringement and validity of UK patents. 
uh, the global frown determination came from relief for infringement. Um, and so, so the appropriate forum was the UK. Um, and on the request for, for the case management stay, uh, the legal test is whether the circumstances were sufficiently rare and compelling to, to, justify, to justify the grant of the stay. And the judge decided that on the facts, there weren't. So um, Oppo appealed this decision. Uh, and it was Lord Justice Arnold who, who gave the leading judgment on appeal. Uh, and he agreed with the uh, first instance judge's characterization of the claim as being about infringement of UK patents. And he, and he noted that, well, you know, if this really was about, you know, uh, better characterized as a global frown dispute, then, uh, you know, OPPO wouldn't be challenging the infringement and uh, essentiality and validity of these patents. Um, he also noted that Nokia's uh, injunction claim was a key part of the relief uh, being claimed and that this was territorially linked to the UK. And he said that even if he was wrong and the dispute was better characterized as a, as a, as a global frown dispute, there was no natural forum for the dispute, and as a result, no, no forum would be most appropriate. And on the case management stay, um, Arnold didn't see any reason to disturb the, the judge's first instance findings. Um, he thought that there weren't really any good reasons advanced for the stay. It, it was Oppo who had pre um, commenced parallel proceedings in China after the UK litigation, and so their arguments about saving time and costs didn't really, didn't really hold water. So, so why is this case interesting? Well, firstly, uh, the statement from the court that there's no particular natural forum for a Fran dispute, even when the majority of sales were going on in China, I think is quite interesting. Um, secondly, it remains the case that where UK SEPs are an issue, um, England remains very much uh, an appropriate forum for res resolving Fran disputes between the parties, even if there are parallel proceedings afoot elsewhere. But, but what about a, a freestanding action, by, by which I mean um, a, a, an action that's based purely on the, the, um, the implementer's contractual right to a FRAN license? Um, that was the subject of this next case, which is uh, Kijin and Thales. Uh, and in this case, Thales had, had given an undertaking to uh, a standards body to grant licenses for GSM technology um, on, on FRAN terms. And Kijin brought a, brought a claim in the UK for a freestanding FRAN determination based on Thales' undertaking. Um, Thales tried to argue that the English court didn't have jurisdiction to hear um, the FRAN claim that wasn't linked to infringement of UK patents. Um, Thales also argued that the, the case should be stayed as um, Kijin had not provided an undertaking to, to enter into the court-determined license. Now, the judge, the judge looked at this and said that um, the plea to case did raise a proper contractual basis to bring the claim, and that a finding of infringement wasn't necessary um, to settle the Fran terms. But on the facts, the, the case was actually stayed on a grounds of abuse of process because it became clear prior to the hearing that Kitchen was not actually prepared to undertake to enter into the court-determined license. So um, as Dr. Evil's pointing out on the side there, uh, it wasn't too surprising um, that, that, that Kijen were having a few commitment issues because um, they were also seeking a, a declaration of non-infringement, um, and if they were successful in that, they might not need the, um, the Fran license. So the, the judge decided to impose a stay, um, which would be lifted either once Kijen uh, agreed to give the undertaking or amended its pleading to make it clear that it sought a Fran determination in the usual way, contingent on a, a valid and infringed patent. Uh, why is this decision important? Um, it confirms that SCP implementers um, have the legal right to, to bring a claim for, uh, for a FRAN determination based purely on the patentee's undertaking to grant FRAN licenses. Um, but you need to get your story straight as to whether you actually want to want a FRAN license. Um, and it's probably worth mentioning that um, the, the, the judge said that an undertaking wouldn't be necessary in every case. It was just on the facts of this case he thought it was because um, Kijen were looking unwilling. We move on from a kind of high techy kind of cases to a, a case which um, involves not 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 high tech mobile phones, but actually did give rise to one of the most uh, interesting uh, applications of the law, or at least so we think, um, in 2022. So in this dispute, um, Vernicare owned two patents uh, to molded paper 
pulp wash bowls, uh, one to the shape and one to the composition. Um, these bowls are essentially provided to bedbound patients in hospital, um, and they have to be able to uh, hold uh, quite a substantial amount of water and not to disintegrate um, when soap, etc., uh, are used um, by patients. So MFP, uh, sorry, Vernicare's patents uh, were um, the object of them was to overcome those those issues. So as you can see from the, the picture on the, the slide, that's a, a picture from the shape pattern. It has, um, and as required by the claims, multiple recesses um, at particular angles um, around the bowl, which help lifting it, taking it away from the patient um, without it kind of collapsing. Um, molded fiber uh, products were alleged to uh, infringe these patents and they counterclaimed for invalidity. Um, the ground in a partic uh, that we're going to concentrate on and is particularly interesting um, was an attack of obviousness based on the CGK. Um, and this case um, was heard by one of the deputy judges, but also the shape patent had been litigated in the UK about 10 years or so ago, and on that occasion had been held valid. Um, but several uh, findings had been made as to construction um, of the claims, and those were taken on board and applied in this case as well. So what happened? Um, the picture on the screen here is the allegedly infringing uh, MFP product. And as I think you can see from the, the red oval there, it has one single um, recess or ridge that goes all the way around. And so it doesn't have this multiple ridges that were required under the claim. And so for that reason and some other reasons um, that were, we, won't, we won't go into, um, there was no infringement found under the normal construction. So the judge went on to consider the doctrine of equivalence, and this is where the squeeze argument with obviousness uh, comes in. Um, MFP uh, uh, argued that if this sing the single ridge around the outside of the bowl was common general knowledge, and that was something which the judge agreed with. Therefore, if under the doctrine of equivalence, the claim was so wide as to cover um, MFP's product, it would also read onto the CGK and be invalid. Um, so the judge held that that can't have possibly been what the patentee would have intended, so there should be a strict interpretation of the claims and MFP's product would not infringe, and the MFP would also therefore be able to rely on the Formstein defense. Um, this is a defense which comes from the German case of the same name and essentially comes into play in circumstances such as these where there is no infringement under the normal construction, but there could be infringement under the doctrine of equivalence, but it would take the um, reading of the claim so wide that it would read on to the prior art. Um, it's the, the, um, yeah, so the judge had to, to consider that and he, that's, that's the kind of conclusion that he came to. Um, I've got a point on the slide just there about long felt want. There was um, an argument made out by Werner Care about um, the, the commercial need and, and longing for these bowls within the industry. That wasn't made out on the evidence, but it is um, something which takes up several pages um, in the decision. And if you're looking to make arguments in that regard, it would be something I would suggest to have a look at. So why um, is this case important? Um, it's the first application of the Formstein defense in the English courts. It has um, raised, its head, raised its head before um, in Obiter comments uh, in Facebook and Voxer um, and also uh, in Technotex, <coughs> but in this case it was kind of front and center. Um, and it required the judge to decide whether the patent would be found invalid in such circumstances or whether it would be found valid but not infringed. And he, as I already said, picked valid but not infringed, and that follows the uh, reasoning of the German case, um, the German Formstein case as well. So this case is another one which is on appeal due to be heard mid-June, and so hopefully we might get some clarification uh, from the Court of Appeal on how this uh, defense should be applied in this case and in others. Um, and personally, I think this case is also an interesting um, one for reasons why, particularly for a defendant, uh, sometimes validity and infringement uh, best heard together. All right, um, so this next case is about catalytic converters. Um, hopefully it's not too exhausting. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, in fact, the case is more about uh, extraterritorial damages, which, um, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, is something of a hot topic at the moment as we await the start of the UPC. Uh, 
so the pattern in suit here, which had been held valid and infringed, relates to high surface area cerium oxide uh, used in catalytic converters for cars. And the, the customer for both party cerium oxide products was uh, Johnson Matthey, which builds uh, the catalytic converters to sell to the car manufacturers. Now, NEO, who was the defendant, uh, provided samples of the infringing product to Johnson Matthey in the UK to produce uh, prototype catalytic converters um, for the car manufacturers to test and approve. And once the prototypes were approved, NEO then supplied Johnson Matthey with large quantities of cerium oxide which had been manufactured abroad where there was no patent protection. Now the claimant was obviously a bit fed up about this because in their view it was, it was the supply of the infringing samples in the UK to create the prototypes which created the opportunity for NEO to make the sales abroad. And so the key question in this case was whether the losses from the overseas sales were recoverable. Uh, and Mrs. Justice Bacon um, held that the overseas losses were recoverable in principle, subject to the, uh, the usual pr um, principles um, of causation and remoteness. Now, there's two aspects to remoteness. There's remoteness in the sense of whether the damage was reasonably foreseeable. And secondly, there's, there's uh, remoteness in the sense of whether there's a sufficiently direct causal nexus between the infringing act and the damage. So on the facts of this case, even though the, the supply of the samples uh, in the UK created an opportunity which led to the sales being made abroad, so uh, factual causation was established, and that this was foreseen and intended by NEO, so reasonable foreseeability of damage was established, um, there was not a sufficiently direct causal nexus between uh, the infringing acts um, in England and the overseas sales. Uh, so another way of saying that is that the, the, legal, the, the chain of legal causation was broken, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and the judge gave three reasons for her decision. Uh, the first is that there were multiple inter inter intervening contingencies between the infringing and the non-infringing supplies. Uh, such as, for example, decisions taken by Johnson Matthey over which catalyst to use uh, and decisions by the car manufacturers on which catalyst platform to use. Um, secondly, the, the infringing and non-infringing samples were not made together or under the same contract. Uh, and thirdly, Johnson Matthey actually wanted a, a, a choice of suppliers, so it wasn't inevitable that, that a sale by NEO would result in a, a lost sale by the claimant. So the claimant failed to recover um, its losses for the, for the sales abroad. Now, the, the appeal decision came down in early January this year, um, and I'm not going to say much about that, it's safe to say that the decision was essentially upheld on um, pretty much the same reasoning. Why is this case important? Well, um, it confirms that overseas losses are in principle recoverable, but, but legal causation is particularly important. Um, and the key question for, for legal causation um, is whether the infringement of the UK is a sufficiently significant driver of the overseas sales, such that they can be regarded as the the, the common sense or the, the proximate cause of those sales. Um, and I also think that, that, that this de decision demonstrates quite handily the importance of considering which jurisdictions you're obtaining and maintaining patent protection, um, particularly uh, where you've got a, a, a global industry such as car manufacturing. Um, and this uh, is um, a patent case between Novartis and Teva, and it relates to two patents owned by Novartis, uh, a parent and a divisional, um, which are to the formulations of its medicine, X-Jade. Um, X-Jade is a, a medicine that essentially removes iron from the blood, um, which you give to patients uh, potentially after uh, blood transfusions. Um, the patents here, as I mentioned, formulation patents, and they relate to film-coated tablets um, with a particular range, 45 to 60% of the active ingredient um, and certain excipients. Um, essentially, before the patent, uh, patients could be taking between three and seven um, dispersible tablets a day. And so the um, invention behind the patent is to introduce uh, this film-coated tablet, which also has um, increased bioavailability and, and takes away some of the other side effects um, which were seen uh, in the, with the prior art. Um, both of the patents had been uh, opposed at the opposition division and upheld. Um, but in the UK, they were subject to an attack of obviousness by Teva on the basis of three uh, pieces of prior art. 
um, and Teva also sought a declaration of non-infringement. Um, as it says on the slide, central to the case um, was the issue of the inventive concept of the patents, and I'll come on to talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, infringement was alleged by Novartis um, on the basis of the doctrine of equivalence only, um, it being accepted that there would be no infringement um, under normal construction. Um, this case was heard by His, His Honour Judge Hakon um, in February, March, um, with judgment in November. So what happened? Um, the patents were held invalid and not infringed. Um, as I mentioned, that the inventive concept was really um, the key uh, here and what kind of the rest of the decision flowed from. Um, Novartis uh, presented um, an inventive concept which was essentially aligned with that which had been put before the EPO, um, that the patents were to um, defurosorox, the active ingredient, with the um, particular range, but also with this increased bioavailability and reduced side effects. Teva put forward um, uh, uh, an inventive concept which was really limited to just the active ingredient within the 45 to 68% range. Um, Hakon stepped through the case law and considered that anything that is outside of the claim, um, and so mm, uh, could not be part of the inventive concept. So the technical effects of the increased bioavailability and the reduced side effects, which weren't spelled out in the claim, couldn't be taken into account um, when considering the inventive concept of the patent. He went on to construct his own inventive concept and then looking at the um, uh, prior art which was uh, presented by Teva found that the patents were um, invalid. Um, as part of the proceedings, Novartis made arguments about the fact that technical effect was taken into account at the EPO um, and was in line with the kind of EPO's problem solution approach. Um, and while um, Hakon uh, did recognize that, when looking at the UK Pozzoli test, considered that there was no scope for him to uh, consider those kind of effects um, with an inventive step. Um, he also, uh, the judge also um, noted that technical effects are important for plausibility, but again found that that's not to be taken into account for inventive step. Um, on infringement, um, as I mentioned, this was under the doctrine of equivalence and related to the range, the 45 to 60 um, percent range. Um, Teva's product was over that range. Uh, and while um, the judge held that the Actavis test for doctrine of equivalence can apply to numerical ranges, um, it did not in this instance result in infringement because uh, that range was part of the inventive concept and so it should have a strict interpretation and so your product had to be within the 45 to 60 uh, percent, otherwise there would be no infringement. So we brought this case to everyone's attention today because of the narrow construction of the inventive concept being matter only in the claims uh, and to pose the question of whether that is correct and how that sees us departing from the EPO's approach on um, inventive step further, um, particularly where, as we see, a recognition that, that um, there is an acceptance of technical effects and plausibility and plausibility and inventive step kind of stand at a crossroads together. Um, we also wanted to highlight the case um, because of the application of the doctrine of equivalence um, to numerical ranges. We have seen this applied before in cases such as Regen, and there the doctrine of equivalence was allowed to expand the range out. Um, the difference in this case, the judge said, was um, in, in the Regen case, that numerical range was of kind of minimal importance, whereas here the range was central to the inventive concept, and so you couldn't stretch it out. Um, there was also some notes um, in the case from the judge about the interaction between experts when you have a skilled team um, and the degree uh, and level of that kind of interaction is not something which um, is clear and we hope perhaps we'll get some further guidance on that um, this year or next from the judges as we go forward. We are reaching a new high on our list now with case number five about cannabis-derived medicines. <laughs> Um, and whether the English court has jurisdiction to determine infringement of foreign patents. So before I start on this one, um, I think I need to introduce what's often referred to in the case law as the, the Mozambique rule, which says that the, the English court has no jurisdiction in respect to proceedings which are principally concerned with determining the title to foreign land or, um, or by analogy, um, a claim to the validity of a foreign patent. The, the facts of this one uh, are as follows. Um, Otsuka and GW Pharma entered into 
uh, a research agreement, um, not to grow tomatoes, as it might suggest on the slide, but to identify new cannabis-derived medicines for the, for the treatment of the central nervous system and cancer. And, and both parties had um, the option to take ownership of any new drug candidates identified during the collaboration. Uh, and if that option was exercised uh, and the, con the candidate was launched commercially, um, then royalties would be payable um, to the non-owning party. But neither Otsuka nor GW exercised this option during the, the term of the collaboration. And then, rather mysteriously, five years later, um, GW launched a new cannabis-derived medicine um, for treating epilepsy. I I'm going to say it wrong, but hopefully someone can correct me. I I I Epidiolex? Um, anyone? Epidiolex, thank you. Thank you very much for whoever that was. Um, right, so, um, so, so uh, GW claimed that they developed this all by themselves, okay, not, not as part of the collaboration. Uh, and Otsuka were obviously a, a bit sceptical about this because um, they subsequently brought a claim against GW in the, in the UK, alleging they were owed significant royalties um, from the sale of Epidiolex. Um, it, it's probably worth mentioning at, at this point that um, although the, the research room was governed by New York law, there was no exclusive jurisdiction clause uh, in the agreement. So this decision is not actually about the, the royalty dispute between the parties, but about the, the jurisdictional challenge by GW. Um, and at the time of this challenge, GW had not served a defence, um, but it was clear uh, from the evidence for the hearing that um, the two main issues which were going to be in dispute were, uh, firstly, uh, whether the product was developed independently or part of the collaboration, um, but secondly, whether Epidulex was covered by a valid claim of relevant patent under which royalties were going to be payable. And it was the second one which was the important one because um, GW argued that it would involve determining the validity of foreign patents, which was not allowed under the, under the Mozambique rule. Now, at first instance, the, the judge decided that the, um, the dispute wasn't principally about the validity of foreign patents and therefore uh, the Mozambique rule didn't apply. Uh, and that was because GW's principal defense was that the product was developed independently. And, and so this, the, the dispute could be resolved without the question of validity ever having to be determined. But even if it was necessary to consider the validity of uh, foreign patents, the, the case could be managed to avoid the UK court ruling on those questions. Uh, so, for example, you might have a, a case management stay pending a decision of a, of a foreign court. Um, now, it was Lord Justice Burse who heard the appeal of this, and um, he upheld the first instance decision. And he took this opportunity to clarify the application of the Mozambique rule to patents cases um, and its exceptions. So, uh, he explained that the, the Mozambique rule doesn't apply where the courts of England and Wales have jurisdiction over a dispute between two private parties unless the proceedings are principally concerned uh, with uh, validity of foreign patents. And proceedings will not be principally concerned with the validity of foreign patents uh, where the court is um, considering the hypothetical consequences for validity when determining infringement. But just because, just because proceedings aren't principally concerned with validity, that doesn't mean that the court can determine a direct claim to um, that the, the, a foreign uh, patent is invalid. Now, the, the, the Mozambique rule is also subject to a, a contractual exception, and that allows the English court to address the validity of foreign patents to the limited extent necessary to determine, uh, decide contractual obligations between um, private parties, but those decisions are not, are not binding against the world. So on the facts of this case, um, the court wasn't precluded with dealing from the dispute because uh, it wasn't principally concerned with the validity of foreign patents, um, and in any event, the, uh, it fell within the contractual exception to the Mozambique rule. So why is this case important? Well, um, firstly, because uh, it's an appeal-level authority, which confirms um, previous first instance decisions that the, the English courts can consider um, foreign patent validity indirectly when determining whether royalties are payable under a, a license. Um, and secondly, it shows that the English court uh, is only likely to decline jurisdiction where the challenge to foreign patent validity is either a direct challenge or a central feature of the case. C. 
So we're back to life sciences, but don't worry. I'm not in my five minutes going to attempt to summarize all of these cases uh, that <laughs> happened in the ongoing saga between Neurum uh, and generics or Milan uh, last year. But I probably guess most people are familiar with the background to the case, and I'm going to try and focus on uh, one of the cases that happened uh, last year, um, and in particular in relation to the divisionals. So just as a brief um, recap, this relates to the long-running dispute uh, um, over the infringement and validity of Neurim's patents uh, for its insomnia medicine, Cicadin. Um, the parent patent was upheld by the High Court back in 2020, but was then ultimately invalid at the EPO when Neurim pulled their um, Technical Board of Appeal um, appeal. <laughs> um, and so the, patent, the parent patent was then centrally uh, invalid. Um, Following uh, that, uh, a divisional patent was granted to Neurim. They then came and sought to enforce that against Mylan and against Teva um, in the UK. And it's the, the case against Mylan on this divisional, which is the one we're going to focus on today. Um, so as part of that uh, dispute, there was a preliminary issue which was heard, and that was whether or not Mylan should be stopped uh, from being able to challenge the validity of the divisional patent, which in the UK had been amended to essentially be aligned with the, parent, the claims of the parent patent, which had been held valid in this jurisdiction. Um, and uh, essentially, Neurim was concerned that M if Milan wasn't stopped, it would then seek to have a full validity uh, trial in relation to the divisional patent, which would push um, any decision off until after the uh, expiry date of the divisional patent and therefore make any final injunction really have no bite. Um, Mylan, on the other hand, were obviously concerned having effectively won overall with the patent being revoked um, at the EPO, uh, that they wouldn't have the opportunity to um, put its arguments forward on validity in relation to this patent. So we move forward onto a preliminary uh, issues hearing um, which I'll talk about the outcome of on the next slide. Um, but as a bit of a contrast, we'll also look um, at the interim injunctions which uh, Neurim sought to obtain um, against Teva on the basis of this divisional patent as well. Spoiler. Uh, so, uh, in relation to Milan, um, <clears throat> Mr. Justice Mead uh, held that there was no uh, issue of stoppel um, in challenging the divisional patent. Um, he looked at whether or not, at the relevant time, Milan could have um, appealed uh, on the points that they wished to make uh, in their validity claim, and he held that at the relevant time, as he saw it, they were the effective winners because of this uh, revocation at the EPO, and so they wouldn't have been able to appeal, and on that basis, there was no issue of stoppel. Um, the preliminary issues uh, judgment then actually goes on to consider how um, this validity trial should go ahead in relation to the divisional. Um, and it is ordered by Mr. Justice Mead that that goes ahead um, as a kind of, a, almost like a paper trial based on the arguments, um, evidence that have been put forward um, in relation to the parent patent and on the basis of the findings that were made by Mr. Justice Marcus Smith in relation to the parent patent. Um, roll on a couple of weeks and uh, a, a provisional judgment um, after an assessment on the papers is given by Mr. Mar Justice Marcus Smith on the divisional and he holds that the patent is valid and infringed. Um, he gives Mylan the opportunity to make oral representations to him on that, which they take up, but that makes no difference and the patent is still held to be valid and infringed. Uh, Mylan seek to appeal, um, that permission to appeal is dismissed on the basis that the uh, points Mylan now wish to make are new facts and that the, uh, the decision from the EPO revoking the parent patent should be treated as any other juris uh, decision from another jurisdiction, so it's not decisive. Um, as such, a final injunction was imposed upon Mylan and they were exited from the market. Contrast that to the position with Teva. Um, they were also on the market uh, selling their generic version of Cicadin, uh, and uh, Neurim sought uh, an interim injunction against them not once but twice. The first one uh, was before the validity decision on the divisional pattern, and the second after. Um, they lost out, uh, Neurim lost out and Teva won uh, both times uh, in that instance, um, because when the judge um, considered in that case whether uh, the American cyanamid test for the interim injunction, he found that damages would not be an adequate remedy for Teva at any point. 
there had also been, um, so the balance of convenience therefore fell down on Teva's side, there had also been a little bit of a delay in seeking um, the interim injunction, and so the status quo also fell for Teva on both sides. The injunction was refused twice over, and Teva stayed on the market while Mylan exited stage left. So we picked this as an important case because it shows an approach the court may take when dealing with divisionals, um, particularly where there's already been a case on the parent patent. It may be the unique you know, facts of this case, um, but we thought it was um, you know, worth, worth bringing to everyone's attention. Um, shows the importance of aligning strategies between the EPO and the UK. Um, and obviously it's uh, a good result for, for Neurim having their divisional patent found valid but it's uh, kind of a question out there whether this sort of practice with divisionals is one that's fair um, and something which maybe we can consider as we go forward. Uh, you can all breathe a big sigh of relief that this next case has nothing to do with jurisdiction. Um, it's all about unjustified uh, threats of patent infringement. Uh, the key issue in this case was not um, whether Amazon was as brave as poor little baby Yoda over there when it comes to mean nasty threats. Um, but more generally about whether the threats provisions uh, apply in respect of communications which are sent to um, big, large, powerful online retailers um, who may be less likely to be fearful of, of, of those threats and um, have their own IPR policy for dealing with them. So uh, the background to this case is that Kaku and Noco both produce battery-powered car jump starters, uh, a bit like the ones on the slide there, uh, and both sold products uh, on Amazon UK. Uh, now, Amazon has uh, an, uh, an IPR policy that um, is designed to protect rights holders, and rights holders can file complaints on the Amazon website using an infringement form. And in 2020, Noco did just that. It, it filed a, a number of complaints using this form that certain Kaku products sold on Amazon. It, it, it infringed its patent um, and requested the removal of the product from, from the website. There was also uh, at least one communication between Noco and Amazon where Noco explained that it had taken infringement action against um, other third-party distributors uh, who had infringed its patent in the past. Now, as a result of these, um, these notifications, Amazon delisted a number of Kaku products. Um, now, Kaku was obviously familiar with the, say the saying, don't get mad, get even, because it then tried to delist a number of... Um, of Noco's products, but unfortunately were unsuccessful because um, Noco was able to persuade Amazon to keep them, keep them on the website in return for an indemnity. Uh, so in response to these events, probably feeling quite frustrated, Kaku brought proceedings in the UK um, against Noco, alleging that the, the patent was invalid and that the communications um, between Noco and Amazon amounted to unjustified threats of uh, patent infringement within the meaning of the Patents Act. However, at the, at the trial, um, the patent was, was ultimately held invalid, so there could be no defense that the, the threats were justified. So, so really, the key question here was therefore the, was, was whether the notification sent to Amazon amounted to threats of proceedings within the meaning of the Patents Act. So um, it was Mr. Justice Mead looking at this one, and um, he decided that ordinarily, these would be classic examples of threats because um, they, they stated that a patent existed, they alleged infringement of the patent, and they demanded that action be taken um, to, to end the infringement. Um, but, but Mr. Justice Me made it clear that it was important that these communications were, were considered in context. So um, the sign there uh, is really important. Context matters. Um, uh, Noco, Noco tried to argue that Amazon wouldn't have feared being sued because Amazon saw itself as this sort of arbiter and enforcer of IP uh, and not a, a potential infringer. And also that um, uh, the, the infringement form was really a first step, but, but further steps were needed to escalate the issues, such as instructing lawyers. Um, and also, uh, Noco argued that, that it hadn't sued Amazon previously when Amazon had refused to delist a product in a, in a few number of cases. Um, now, as it happens, Noco would never sue Amazon because uh, Amazon's a, a valuable customer. Um, Mr. Justice Mead listened to all this, but, but he disagreed because, um, in his view, it was only if Amazon automatically delisted the products in response to a complaint 
could there be a suggestion that Amazon would never feel threatened by legal proceedings? Um, but the evidence was that Amazon actually took a more selective approach. It, it, it weighed up the, you know, the, the, the risk of infringement against various other factors uh, to make a sort of informed decision. Um, the other thing was that Amazon didn't actually know that Noco would never sue it, even if it thought it was probably unlikely, um, and certainly hadn't received any assurances um, from Noco that it wouldn't be sued. So the, the judge found that the, the communications were threats against Amazon itself. But even, the judge said even if he was wrong about that, and, and um, the, the threat hadn't been made to sue Amazon directly, then under Section 70 of the Patents Act, um, that section doesn't require the person receiving the threat to be the, the, the same person at risk of infringement proceedings. So um, it was sufficient for Carcu to establish that Amazon understood that Carcu or a third party distributor um, would be sued if Amazon didn't delist the, the products from the website. Um, and that was clearly established, um, that was clearly established on the evidence. So, um, is the threats department closed for business following this decision? Well, the case is a useful reminder that, um, that, that, that the rights holders who are alleging infringement need to consider the, the content of their communications very carefully, even when you're using a, an online pro forma procedure. Um, now, the judge, the judge in this case was keen to emphasize that this decision is, is really specific to the facts and doesn't apply to all online marketplaces, but it's difficult to see why the same reasoning wouldn't apply um, in other cases where a patentee is asking an online retailer to stop selling a patented product, and the retailer exercises a degree of discretion in, in, in deciding whether to take down, uh, take down the product. Ultimately, I think, I think what's going to be important is, is the nature of the specific communications, um, including whether those communications uh, fall within a safe harbour um, in the threats provisions of the Patents Act, um, and the specifics of the IPR policy itself. So this is our top life sciences case, uh, as we see it from, from last year, and uh, it involves quite a, an unusual and uh, specific set of facts. Um, so, in this dispute uh, between Teva and Novartis in relation to uh, Novartis's product Gelenia, um, the active ingredient of which is Fingolimod, um, Novartis had been seeking to uh, obtain a patent to a particular dosing form uh, for a number of years. Um, the patent had been refused by the examining division in 2020, um, and an uh, appeal <coughs> was made and uh, heard, and, but not until February 2022. Um, at that hearing, um, Novartis was successful and the patent was ordered to be granted. The claims were set um, and everything was put in motion. Um, it was just the administrative steps of formally getting uh, the patent to grant, which was required. Shortly after this decision uh, from the TBA, uh, Teva sought an Arrow Declaration um, in the UK that uh, making and selling um, uh, its generic Fengolimod product, um, according to the, the dosing in the patent, would have been um, obvious at the time, at the priority date of the patent. It was all happening, as I said, in this uh, kind of short period of time. Um, the market was uh, kind of gearing up to um, go generic and some tenders were, were opening with generics looking like they were about to enter. And so um, shortly after the Arrow Declaration in early March last year, Novartis commenced uh, infringement proceedings against uh, uh, generics and sought um, an interim injunction within those proceedings against five generic defendants on the basis of this pending but not yet granted patent application. Um, so the application for an interim injunction on the basis of a pending patent um, was uh, unprecedented um, and so before the court could go on to consider um, the kind of merits, it had to consider whether it actually had uh, jurisdiction to go ahead and grant such a, a, an injunction. Um, so having considered the, the scope of the um, Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act, which gives the discretion to grant injunctions, uh, as well as a recent uh, Privy Council case of Conway, which really um, kind of showed the, 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 the broad scope of Section 37 is essentially unlimited um, unless there's a particular statutory bar. Um, the court then looked at the Patents Act to see whether there would be a statutory bar to granting an injunction and came to the conclusion there was not. 
So it was technically possible um, for the court to grant uh, an, a preliminary injunction on the basis um, of, a, of a pending patent application in these circumstances. However, um, when considering the facts of the case, um, the judge uh, declined to grant the injunction. Um, as I mentioned, the market was a tender market, um, and so the, he felt that there wouldn't be the kind of usual price spiral arguments because there's only a certain number of tenders. The generic wouldn't want to then um, put their prices down so low when they entered that they, um, you know, there was no kind of race to the bottom. He also didn't accept evidence from Novartis that it would be difficult um, if an injunction was later granted for Novartis to go back to its original price from uh, by, like a price increase against the generics price. Um, so in doing all of that, he accepted that damages would be an adequate remedy uh, for Novartis. Looking on the flip side, he said for the generics there wouldn't be. Um, damages wouldn't be an adequate remedy. Um, because there's several of them vying for the same tenders. We wouldn't know who would win or what the price would ultimately be. Um, and so that kind of looking at that counterfactual was much more complicated um, than, than the flip side for Novartis. Um, so no injunction was granted. Novartis uh, sought to appeal that, um, and that permission to appeal was refused by uh, Lord Justice Burse, uh, him saying that while... Um, the judge has to look at the evidence, he doesn't have to accept it uncritically. And so the kind of refusal to accept some of Novartis' evidence on the um, suggestion that the increasing of the price of, if a later injunction um, was granted and the generics had to withdraw um, was open to the judge to do. He didn't have to just accept what was written on the paper. Um, although Lord Justice Burst did make an interesting comment that if there was evidence that the price increase, you know, uh, couldn't be go back, then that might be a suggestion of irreparable harm to Novartis and could have been um, important in, in the injunction. And that raises, as we'll come on to, an important question of what evidence do you need um, to get an interim injunction. Um, now, just to uh, look at a little bit about the Arrow Declaration, um, by the time the patent had granted in the UK, Novartis had chosen to de-designate um, the UK uh, from that patent application. And so several of the... Um, issues around the arrow had fallen away um, and several of the infringement actions had also gone too. Um, Teva had chosen to continue its arrow declaration um, and as you may recall in order for an arrow to proceed um, it has to do justice to both the claimant and the defendant and serve a useful purpose. Um, Teva had five useful purposes that they'd put to the court but by the end of the hearing before Mrs Justice Bacon um, she had ultimately found that only two of those were still in play and they related to use of the UK decision um, before German court and potential use of um, uh, the judgment to defend against a possible PI application in a country through which Teva's product transited en route to the UK. However, because both of those were kind of external to the UK and there was no uncertainty as to the UK rights um, following the previous case law, the arrow was refused and that was upheld um, in no uncertain terms um, by Lord Justice Arnold um, at the Court of Appeal in December. So why is this important? Um, it's the first time the court has had to consider um, the, its power to grant a pre-grant a pre uh, interim injunction. Um, it also, as I alluded to, uh, gives us all food for thought to think about what kind of evidence um, is needed for an interim injunction application. Um, and I think I didn't mention it when I was talking about the previous case, uh, the Neurim case in which Teva um, was successful in defending against its interim injunction application. It had also put forward quite a lot of evidence in that case um, about its sales. Um, this is also finally just a, a kind of another aside, say another arrow declaration that's been dismissed after a, um, a UK patent was de-designated. Um, and so it confirms that arrow declarations will only be granted um, where the sole pur well, will not be granted where the sole purpose is really to influence a foreign court when it's making a decision under its own foreign law. That's not their purpose. Yeah, number one. Can anyone guess what it is? Any guesses? <laughs> no? Uh, so, <laughs> um, it, Optus and Apple. Um, yes. So, this is more swashbuckling in the telecoms field. Uh, this time we're on uh, injunctions in uh, SEP disputes. So in this decision, um, Optus had successfully established um, that Apple had infringed some valid and essential patents. And the key question 
was whether Optus was entitled to an injunction immediately after a technical trial if Apple refused to, under, to undertake to enter into the court-determined FRAN license, or whether Optus had to wait to, uh, till a later trial at which the, the FRAN rates would be set. Then the, the next question was, um, if Optus was entitled to an injunction now, um, should it be entitled to the usual, the usual form of injunction or a more limited form of injunction um, which ceases to have effect um, once the defendant agrees to enter into the court-determined FRAN license, which is sometimes called a, a, a FRAN injunction. Now, Optus was arguing for a more permanent injunction um, on the basis that Apple, because Apple re refused here and now to, to give the undertaking to enter the court-determined license, um, it was an unwilling licensee and therefore not entitled to uh, the benefits of uh, the protection of the patentee's undertaking to, to grant FRAN licenses. Uh, Apple also argued that, that Optus was not entitled to injunction in any event because um, it abused its dominant position by uh, using the threat of an injunction to demand excessive royalties and for uh, dragging uh, Apple into litigation without giving it adequate time to consider um, uh, Optus's rates properly. Now, central to the issues here were... Um, Clause, was Clause 6.1 of the uh, IPR policy of the Standard Setting Organization, Etsy. Uh, and that clause requires holders of standard essential patents to, um, to give an irrevocable undertaking to, to grant FRAN licenses to essentially to those that request them. And the first instance decision was um, heard by Mr. Justice, the, the, the first instance case was heard by Mr. Justice Mead, and he held that Optus was entitled to uh, an immediate FRAN injunction unless and until Apple gave um, an appropriate undertaking to take the court-determined FRAN license. All right, so um, Apple appeals, uh, and in fact, in fact, both Apple, Apple gave the required undertaking and both parties appealed this one. And the, the leading judgment was given by Lord Justice Arnold. And he, he also, well, he upheld the first instance decision. Uh, and what he said was that, um, it, that, that you have to interpret the Etsy IPR policy to avoid issues uh, both of hold up uh, and of hold out, as that's, um, that's what the purpose of the policy is. So um, just in, in very brief terms, hold up is using the threat of an injunction to uh, extract some reasonable royalties, uh, and, and hold, hold out is essentially unreasonably delaying conclusion of a license to uh, avoid paying royalties. Um, and there's no prizes for guessing which one of those pictures is which. Um, but basically, in order to avoid hold up and hold out, the, um, the court has to be able to enforce its determination against both parties. So that involves um, withholding an injunction if a patentee is unwilling to uh, abide by its Etsy undertaking to, to grant FRAN licenses, um, but also um, granting an injunction against an implementer um, who is not willing to, to take a FRAN license. Uh, Arnold also dismissed Apple's suggestion that undertaking to enter into a license without seeing the terms first would be tantamount to signing a blank check um, because it was possible for Apple to estimate the, the royalties due. Um, and of course, the, the court wouldn't set rates which are uncommercial or unviable. Uh, the, the court also dismissed Optus' arguments that it should be able to obtain an unqualified, un, an unqualified injunction because that would promote hold up. Um, and perhaps most interestingly is, um, is that he said that the, the Etsy undertaking is open to um, an implementer to force at any time, even if they previously decided not to do so. So it seems an implementer can change its mind and have a license even when it said that it didn't want one, want, want one in the past. Um, on the competition aspects, um, the first decision was also upheld there. Um, the, the court held that even if there had been an abuse in the past, um, it had no continuing effect because both parties had agreed to be bound by uh, the court-determined FRAN license. And, and so um, in that type of situation, withholding uh, uh, an injunction would leave the patentee without an adequate remedy and would promote holdout. So uh, why is this case important? Well, um, the case is important because it, it, it clarifies that um, a FRAN injunction can be granted uh, as soon as a UK SCP is found valid and infringed um, if the implementer does not agree there and then to undertake to enter the, the, the court-determined FRAN license. 
Um, I think it's also interesting because it, it shows that the patentee's behavior during negotiations um, is unlikely to mean that um, an injunction will not be available. But, but I, personally, my, my reading of this decision is that um, Mr. Justice Arnold felt like that a pair of them have behaved a bit like a naughty pair of naughty school children because um, he writes this, this postscript to the judgment that you can see there um, where he says, the, the state of the, the system in Frank cases is dysfunctional and he accuses both sides of trying to game the system. And then he suggests that the only way that the system can be rectified is if the, the standard setting organizations adopt a, um, a legally binding, um, uh, legally enforceable arbitration clause um, in their IPR policies. So there you go, a nice, nice easy to solution to the uh, complex mess that is friend litigation at the moment. When this is videoed, thank you to those watching it. If you have questions, send them in by email. I'm going to close the recording now.